Good morning. Good morning. Your Bible is open to Hebrews. Last week, we looked at the beginning, gave you a little background of the book of Hebrews. I want to let you know that again, as you're looking at the book of Hebrews, you need to keep in mind that the reason that the book was written was because Jewish believers at the time were going back to Judaism. And they were leaving Christ and going back to the temple services, trying to find God in a relationship with Him there. So the writer of Hebrews writes to them to let them know just how much better Jesus Christ is than what is found at the temple. And so this morning we want to continue on with that. And let's start again with verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. Now who are they talking about here? Okay, so they're talking about Jesus. Well, let's look at this because this is going to help you explain what comes after this. Who, being the brightness of His glory, so in that sentence, who is the who? Did I confuse you yet? The who is Jesus. Jesus is made in the brightness of His, you see that word His is capitalized, of His glory. So you're talking about the Son and the Father. This is really important because when you start getting into this first begotten thing, and you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, if you go to the text before that, you can actually explain what this actually means. Okay? Uh -oh. So, uh-oh! <laughs> That's right! Uh-oh! So to make this easier for you, it says, Jesus being the brightness of the Father's glory and the expressed image of the Father's person. It's Jesus who upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had by Himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So let me ask you a question. This verse here. Does it equate the power of Jesus with the power of the Father? Yes. Does it put Jesus as the express image of the Father? Yes. All right? So there's no doubt about that, correct? You need to understand that because that sets the foundation for what comes next. So here we're all agreed that Jesus is equal with the Father, that Jesus is God. Amen. Okay? And I want you to see that the writer of Hebrews is trying to express that to the readers who are going to read this. That they needed to understand that Jesus wasn't just a man who died on the cross. That he didn't just come as a human being like you and me to save us from our sins. But he was very God. And that God came. And that God sacrificed himself. And that the blood that God shed was so much better than the animal blood that was being sacrificed at the temple. Animal blood, did it have any power to save you from your sin? No. That blood could it cleanse you from your sin. No. It was just a symbol of the lamb that was going to come. And that when he shed his blood, it would be done once and for all time. And so the writers is trying to make this fact that Jesus is the fulfillment of this. <laughs> and that Jesus himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than who? Now, do you think that the Jewish believers who the writer was writing to believed in the ministry of angels? And that, that shouldn't take a lot of thought. You know that they did. Right? If you read your Old Testament, there is plenty of examples of angels ministering to man, coming from God with messages, right? And acting their part in this great controversy. 
So the writer now is trying to establish that the ministry of Christ is so much better than the ministry of angels. Now I want you to see this because the writer puts the ministry of angels higher than the ministry of Moses. Because there's an order that's going to come here in the book of Hebrews. Alright? You read the beginning of the book of Revelation. Ray, can you turn there for me? Revelation chapter 1. Read verses like 1 through 3. Let's see what that says. Revelation 1, 1 through 3. Yes. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel. Stop. Okay, so, when you read that, I'm wanting you to see the ministry of angels and why the writer of Hebrews brings this out, because the Jewish believers were very familiar with the ministry of angels. It tells you in the book of Revelation, that God the Father gave Jesus the information. Jesus gave it to who? <laughs> Read it. Find out. Read it again, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel. Stop. So here is how it goes. The Father gives it to the Son, the Son gives it to the angels, and the angels minister it to us, his servants, right? So again, this is how that works in Scripture. So the Jewish believers understood this, and they knew the importance of the ministry of angels. And so the writer is trying to make them see clearly that Christ surpasses the ministry of angels. Now, we're going to get into this because it talks about this begotten word, okay? Christ's ministry surpasses the ministry of angels. Why? Because he was one of them, another created being in the hierarchy of angels? No. Because he is above the angels. It was through Christ that the angels were actually created. Amen. All right? You find that in the first part of the Gospels of John. That all things were created by Him. And that nothing that was created was created except by Him. Right? So when you're talking to your Jehovah Witness friends, and they start talking about Christ being created, they don't want to go to John, uh, the Gospel of John, in that first part of that chapter. That's one of the reasons. Because you don't have to just get into that word, a God, God, whatever. But it says all things were created by Him. If he was a created being, how could he create himself? Isn't that word all, all encompassing? Amen. <laughs> all right. So if Christ was created, how could he create himself? And then that may help you as well when you're talking with your friend. So the writer of Hebrews sets out from the very beginning to show you the deity of Christ. Do you see that? That He is the express image of the Father. Amen. Okay, so and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as He has by what's that next word? Inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now that is a really strange sentence. Now what does it mean when it says he has by inheritance? What does that word inheritance mean? You know it's talking about Jesus. What did Jesus inherit? Now I heard it. He inherited a kingdom. Right? What kingdom did he inherit? The one we're in. Very good. Now listen. We can read the Bible and we can just really quickly read over a sentence like that and not give it a lot of thought because it takes a lot of thought to try to figure this out. Okay? But the writer is trying to stress a point. And he's trying to make a point of who and what Jesus Christ really is. 
And the readers that would read this would know exactly what he's talking about. Let me ask you a question, because you have to read this book with an idea of what was the mindset of first century Jews. Did they know what it meant to inherit a kingdom? What were they before Moses started to speak to Pharaoh? Slaves. And so did God not bring them into a promised land? Did they not gain an inheritance that they did not work for? Yes. That they did nothing for? Yes. Okay. That when they inhabited those houses, they did not build, reap the fields they did not sow? Did they know what it meant to inherit something? Yes. All right. Now, when they also, in the first century, looked at the state of Jerusalem, with the Romans there, were they looking for a better country? Yes. Yes. Right? Were they looking for a better inheritance? So they had this mind frame that they knew that Jerusalem was supposed to and always be the capital of God's world. And in their experience, they didn't see any of that happening. They were being controlled by the Romans. Right? And now you have this guy Jesus come on the scene who they're saying is the Messiah, but he was crucified on the cross. And if you knew your Old Testament, you knew that anybody that was hung on a tree was cursed by God. How can this guy being cursed be our Messiah? It has everything to do with how God decided to deal with your sin and my sin. And that the only way it can truly be purged was for God himself to become a curse. So this inheritance that Jesus inherited is a kingdom. It's also a name. A name that is above all names and that at that name Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess because Jesus is Lord. That word Lord has the same meaning as being King of Kings, Lord of Lords, that there is nobody equal with Him. Okay? He stands preeminent above all rulers, all powers. There is nothing that is over Him, but everything has been put underneath him. That is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to express to his readers. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of your hopes, all of your dreams. What you think should be the reality can only be found in Christ. You see the Romans here, they won't be here forever. But Jesus Christ will be. Their kingdom is going to fall. And it's going to fall hard, but Jesus Christ's kingdom is going to continue to build and it will last forever. So this inheritance that he has obtained, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance attained a more excellent name than they. For to whom of the angels did the Father ever say, here you go, take your Jehovah Witness friend to this text, if Jesus was created, then to what of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten thee. Now they're going to get you on that word begotten, right? Because if he's begotten, then he's got to have a beginning. Yeah. But is that what that means? No. no. And do you as Adventists, can you explain why it doesn't mean created? But it actually means first in preeminence. Do you know how to explain that? Oh my God, just did. Oh, that's fun. Uh, say that again. Whoever said that? He gave him a kingdom. So when Jesus is begotten, number one, let me ask you, does the Bible contradict itself? This is why I told you and focused on this first part of the verse that we read, read excuse me, of verse 3. We know it's talking about Jesus, 
through Jesus being in the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of the Father's person. Now, what does that mean? The express image of the Father's person. See, in carbon copy, very good, very good translation of that. So what's a carbon copy? A duplicate. He's equal, right? So when you get to this word begotten, you can't forget verse 3, okay? Because it's got to be talking about the same thing and it can't contradict, okay? So you look and go, okay, so this word begotten has to have more than one meaning. It doesn't just mean created. Now, do you know and realize that uh, early Adventist pioneers thought that Jesus was a created being? You didn't know that? You know that James White thought that? So, Adventist history for you. Do you know that it was when Ellen White wrote The Desire of Ages that she put all that to rest? Because in it she wrote that Christ had no beginning, no end, and that... Oh, I had the quote in my head and I lost it now. You can read it for yourself in The Desire of Ages. <laughs> but she put to rest any more controversy of whether Christ was created or whether he's equal with God. I want you to understand this because this is very important. Because as Adventists, we did not come upon this set of doctrines that we hold the first day we became Adventists. Amen. This was something that took a period of time. And do you understand why as Seventh-day Adventists we hold so dearly the truths that were brought forth in the Reformation because we believe that we are a part of that Reformation. Yeah. That we are the culmination of everything that came from all the Reformers, from all the different denominations. That we looked into the Scriptures, saw the truths that they had found, saw that they were in Scripture, accepted those truths. So you can say we're Baptists because we have a big tub back there, right? Amen. Mm -hmm. You can say we're Methodists, you can say we're Wesleyans, so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. Because we have taken the truths that these great reformers have found and we have incorporated them into 28 fundamental beliefs. Okay? And so, we look at truths and our early pioneers took these truths and over a period of decades, not days, decades, they came to the conclusions that we hold dear today. Alright? This church wasn't built on just speculation. The early pioneers thought that the freedom of conscience was the most important thing. That was one of the defining issues of the Protestant Reformation. That it is your conscience liberty of conscience that you will live and that you will die on and that nothing nothing is more powerful except God himself not the state not your parents liberty of conscience that you're able to think for yourselves that's weak I didn't, did I hear an amen, amen. this is why America is in the state it's in today and this is why we're losing the freedoms that we have because we've become so complacent that we don't care anymore as long as you don't affect my bank account, as long as I still have my car and food on my table, I don't care what you do. You better wake up. You better see what's happening. You better know what's going to happen. If you trust in this God, you're going to trust more in your bank account and the food on your table when it's gone. And you're not going to know what to do then. Either you live and you breathe Jesus Christ, the liberty that comes from Him, or you will lose it. Amen. No if, ands, or buts. Sorry. Jesus has become so much better than the angels. He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. What angel did he ever say? To you I'll be a father, and to me you'll be a son. 
But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, oh, there you go, see, the, the Jehovah is going to take, see, firstborn. Firstborn. Now, again, this word firstborn has the same meaning as the word begotten. It is an order of preeminence. Now, what does John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Now, how many times does the writer have to repeat that God was with God and He was God? Okay? Just so that there's no way to misunderstand what he's trying to say. Now, he also says that everything that was created was created by Him. Is that right? So either Hebrews is lying or John is lying if Jesus was created. Right? If they both are in harmony, then it is the word here in our English translation where the problem lies. Okay? Now, didn't we just go through verse 3 where it says that Jesus was the carbon copy of the Father? Okay, so don't forget that. Don't, don't let that slip your mind in two verses, three verses later. So, let me see where I was at. Uh, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God do what? Now, see, you go back to Exodus chapter 20. What does the first commandment say? Have no other God before thou shalt have no other gods before me. What does that mean, thou shalt have no other gods before me? Is that talking about worship? Yeah. Yes. Right? Can you see it? Yes. Why well, do you see this title that I'm making? So, if Jesus was created, and he's the firstborn and created being, but God says let all the angels worship him, then God broke his own commandments. Because the commandment says what? Nor shall you bow down to any of those, right? First, second commandment. So, there you go. So again, it is not a problem with the Bible not um, being in harmony. It is the problem with the translation from the original language to our language and the specific words that we choose to use. You see that? Alright, so, again, let all the angels of God worship Him. And of the angels, He says... Who makes his angels spirits? This is the role of angels. Okay? This is why Satan, Lucifer, was so upset. Why did God create the, the host of angels? Because they were to be ministering spirits. They were to be, what did you say, Ricky? To serve. To serve. Servants. Okay? Satan looked and said, I shouldn't be a servant. I have too much glory. I am too powerful. I should be better than a servant. Right? The angels were created to be servants of God. Now I bet you if you looked in your concordance at that word servant, there may not be a difference between that word servant and slave. It's up to you to look and see. I'm just thinking that out loud right now. For some reason, Lucifer did not like the position that God had placed him in. Is that right? He wanted to attain to so much higher. And God said, no. Where you're at is where you're going to be for all eternity. So again, if Jesus was an angel in the same line of Gabriel, Lucifer, or the other angels, then there's a big problem there. Because God said, let all the other angels worship Him. Right? And God's law says that you should not worship anybody but God Himself. Nor bow down to anything else but God Himself. So okay. he, he coveted the position of His own Creator. Yes. 
That's what he wanted. He wanted to be God. You, you got to think. Now, there are mysteries that we will not know this side of earth, but I've asked this question before. Could Satan ever, ever, even, even for a second, have the power to overthrow God? No. Again, creator, creature. That never changes. But there was something in his wisdom that thought that he could actually ascend to that level. There was something that he knew about God that would allow him to continue with this rebellion and not worry about being wiped out or blocked out, right? What is the only possible answer to that? What could that possibly be? The only possible answer has got to be the humbleness of Christ. There has to be something about Jesus that the devil would see as weakness. Weakness. But it's not weakness at all. I've heard it. Somebody said it very, very, very lowly, but it's God's love. You understand that? God's love. Because that would be the only area that Satan could actually exploit, exploit and abuse and turn it against God. Because he could say, if you do this, then you don't really love the way you say you love. And so God would have to figure out a way to be just and merciful at the same time. And what was the only way he could do that? And that was by God sacrificing God. You understand? Linda, God could never have sent a created being to save you from your sin. Because every created being that you read about in the Bible, sin. Did, did angelic perfection last? Satan was able to turn a third of all the angels against God himself. Angelic perfection failed. Right? Angels can't be a substitute for you. Human beings, could we ever possibly even not do but even think about being perfect enough to pay for our own sins? Only way your sins could be dealt with and done away with where God could still be just and merciful was if God Himself came and sacrificed pure perfection for you. Amen. This is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get across to his readers. This is what has been done for you. This is why Christ is so much better than the angels. Verse 7 of the angels, he says, who makes his angels, excuse me, spirits and his ministers of flame and fire. But to the Son, he says, verse 8, your throne. Now, here you go. Linda, this is the text you take to your Jehovah's Witness for and, and ask him, who's, who, who's the God that's actually being spoken of here? Because it tells you from verse 3 that the Son is the express image of the Father. And it never changes from that. It's starting to show you that the Son and the express image of the Father is so much better than angels. And it shows you the higher place of Christ, the place of angels below him. And then it goes into this text where it says what? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of what? Whose kingdom? The Father or the Son's? Who? No, no, no. Hold on. Who received the inheritance? Who received the kingdom? So it's the Son. See, I'm just talking to you about how you deal with Jehovah's Witnesses. So, again, Jesus said, I am the Father of one. So, Ray, you are right. But you understand where I'm coming from? No, no, I hear you. Okay, so, when you look at the context of this, who is it still being focused on? The Son, right? The Son. So when it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God. Who's God? The Father God is speaking of the Son of the same God. You understand this? Yes. Therefore, God, your God. Jesus said, I do nothing of myself, but I only do the things that the Father has shown me. Amen. Jesus always was subservient to the Father. Amen. Right? Yes. And the Holy Spirit is subservient to Him. 
Jesus said, the Comforter will come, but he won't speak of his own, but he will speak of me. Understand how all this works? So how do you get around this? Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. Yes, we can accept that and understand that. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom that was inherited, that is spoken of in verse 3.